Thank you. Open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 2, chapter 2, and uh, I want us to look at uh, passages in chapter 2 and 4. The title of the message is Living a Life of Wisdom, and uh, we've been in Proverbs for January, and in February we're going to look at some eternal issues, and uh, so next Sunday we'll be out of Proverbs for a spell. I think we need to stay in Proverbs for a while, but sometimes it just gets old if it's the same thing Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. So we'll split it up just a little bit. Um, I hope you notice the children on the front row because there's a lot going on there that you may not see if you're in the back. And one of them is they're being taught how to give in the offering. They're being taught stewardship. And when we greet... They're being taught how to greet people and how to say hello and how to welcome folks. And then when they go back for the children's church, they have several activities and all good. And uh, sometimes uh, when one of them is making a profession of faith, then Stacy brings them in at the invitation. So there's a lot taking place that's good and wholesome in the life of our church and through the different ministries. And so I just wanted you to be aware of that. Uh, You know, we all age, don't we? We just do. But I refuse to get old. Somebody asked me this week, said, you you don't act your age. And how do you do that? And I said, well, I refuse to get old. And I live in my kids' world and in my grandkids' world sometimes. And and I sit and listen and I hear things that I don't have a clue about, but I'll, I'll Google it. Uh, y'all didn't know that, but when you leave, I do a lot of Googling, and, uh, and I learn, and I, I find out what's interesting to them and to their generation and, and how to share and how to communicate, and uh, uh, some things are different, and that's good because this is their generation and their lifespan and their children, and they'll be doing the same thing as they age. Warren Wiersbe, one of the great commentators, said, outlook determines outcome." Outlook determines outcome. And you see in the Old Testament that uh, it was inclusive of both becoming and growing and leadership. Abraham is a classic example. Moses is another example. Moses didn't start his leadership of the children of Israel until he was 80 years old. But he trumped every ounce of that wilderness and got to the mount where he looked over and saw the promised land. And you know, sometimes we may not get to enter the promised land because if we're doing what we're supposed to do as aging people, we are planting trees under whose shade we will not sit. And Proverbs talks a lot about that. I think as a child, many of us were taught to pray, now lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Someone said a few years ago that perhaps the adult prayer today, instead of if I should die before I wake, that we ought to pray, let me wake before I die. It's too soon to give up. If you're going to live a life of wisdom, Proverbs has a lot of instruction on that. And and one of them in three simple points today that I want you to notice and I want you to take to heart, write them down. If you want my notes, let me know your email address and I'll email them to you or I'll message them to you, however we can get them to you. But wise people, wise people are committed to lifelong learning. Lifelong learning. Now, in biblical terms, that's the word for discipleship. We're a learner, we're a disciple, we're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Discipleship means you follow Jesus. And throughout the New Testament, when he looked at folks and said, follow me, he got up from where he was and started walking, and they couldn't stay where they are if they were to follow Jesus. They had to take steps, and they followed him. Someone said, if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to go to the ends of the earth because that's where he's headed. The global cultures, the global people groups all through this world are beautiful and majestic and Christ came to redeem them all. And so that's where he's going. There is a progression in chapter 2 beginning in verse 6. 
Uh, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth comes understanding and knowledge. He holds victory in store for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk, whose walk is blameless. So it is the Lord that gives wisdom. Now, in the book of Proverbs, this is how wisdom was transmitted. The Lord gives wisdom and gave wisdom to Solomon. Solomon, in turn, writes this book, the Proverbs, and he gives wisdom to his children. Now, it's very interesting in Solomon's life, you see him a young man seeking wisdom, a wise man, but there came a time in his later years when he abandoned it all. And he came back later in life. But there was that gap. There was that period. I want you to keep that in mind for later on for the third point of the message. But then Solomon taught parents to teach their children. In chapter 30, verse 6, the scripture says in Proverbs that every word of God is flawless. And we're to digest all of it. We're not to add to it. But we're to take the scriptures, what we know is the scripture, every word is the word of God and is flawless. And we're to immerse ourselves in it. And as parents transmit that to their children, to the son, the son learns obedience. The daughters learn obedience and it's obedience that is lifelong and life-saving and life-giving. Obedience leads to life. Disobedience leads to death. And it's not just a physical death. You can be dead in trespasses and sins while you breathe, Scripture says. So we're to seek the truth. And truth, I want to say something to us. Truth can stand up to scrutiny. Truth can do that. It can stand up to critical examination. Apologetics are fine. That's a part of what we see a lot of today, people learning how to defend what they believe. Most of it degenerates into arguing for what they believe. And that's not the intent of apologetics. Apologetics is intended to teach us how to understand our faith and how to defend our faith. But very often, the apologist in today's world asks questions or answers questions that nobody's asking. And so it doesn't matter how much knowledge we have, if we don't have wisdom to impart that knowledge, it's useless. Wise people are committed to lifelong learning. Discipleship means you follow Jesus. Biblical education leads to divine protection. In verses 5 through 11 in chapter 2, he talks about that. And verse 11, he says, discretion will protect you and understanding will guard you. Now, education is not indoctrination. It's not just taking the scriptures and pounding them into somebody's head. That's cramming a set of belief down their throat without critical examination. And in the Old Testament, there were principles and truth that was taught in the family and even in the schools, and they had schools in the Old Testament. Now, commentators and Bible dictionary folk today, Bill Warren, for example, with the Holman Bible Dictionary, believes that in the Old Testament that the education of the schools were basically for the elite, for the wealthy of society, typically the ruling class, maybe some of their attendants. But Jay Castor, in another dictionary, gives a different picture of literacy and education in the Old Testament. He says it was a great, um, great concern for the education of the young. In ancient Israel, all education was at first religious. The education of the young had two primary goals, and one of those goals in ancient Israel was the transmission of the historical heritage of the Hebrew nation. It was the story of God's covenant with his people and the saga of the working of that covenant in and out in subsequent history. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for example. And what you see in that, in the transmission of history in the Old Testament, is you don't see an indoctrination or anything like that, not if it's done right, but what you see is an awareness of the heritage on which we all stand. Chris Allen brought a little pamphlet by the office earlier this week, and I looked at it, gave it back to him this morning. But in 1982, 
$600,000. Wouldn't it be great if you get a building like that today for $600,000? But that's part of our heritage. Now our methodology may change. But we want to teach our heritage. We want them to communicate and know our heritage as a family. And Proverbs is multi-generational. And in the teaching, in the translation or transmission of the historical heritage, they not only do that, but they also instruct in the ethical conduct of life. Wise people are lifelong learners. Wise people are continually teaching their children, their grandchildren, and, and all who would listen, not only historical heritage, but ethical conduct. How one's life can be conducted for the purpose of obtaining the utmost benefit of life, the abundant life that Jesus talked about. And here you see it in Proverbs in chapter 2 and verse 9. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path. The question is not what are people doing all around us. The question is always what is right, what is truth, what is righteousness, what is justice. Those are the eternal questions on which the Word of God is built. And in Proverbs and in the educational uh, of the people in the Old Testament, that's what they were taught. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, generational gods. Our God is a generational God. We've said that before. And when you look at the key biblical passages that admonish parents to rear their children in the way of the Lord, uh, none are greater than the Shema of the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get Get up. Good instruction is not always just sitting around a table with an open Bible. That's good. But sometimes, as Bill Gaither's old song saying, God loves to talk to little boys while they're fishing. Sometimes it's in the play of life. Sometimes it's in the adventures of life. Sometimes it can be other places because God is not contained in buildings built with men's hands. Wise people are lifelong learners and transmit truth to their children. He's a generational God. It is a lifestyle of wisdom. It's not the guarantee of a problem-free life. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 tells us that we're to train up our children in the way they should go, and when they're old, they'll not depart from it. And when you look at that on the surface, it it just sort of looks like, uh, well, okay, if I just jam enough Bible down them, they're going to get in their late teenage years and go off to college, and they're going to mess up for a few years, but before they die, they'll come back to Jesus. What a horrible way to live. That's not what that verse says at all. The word train has several aspects to it. It it talks about developing a thirst. The word palate is concerned. How, How do you get a young child, a nursing child, to feed? Sometimes you massage their palate. The second aspect is teaching them submission, teaching them to bring their life into the God-given authority. And, and that doesn't mean that they do things that are wrong and stuff like that, but you, you, you have to know how to bow before you can know how to rule. And then you dedicate, you consecrate them. Every child has a certain personality and a certain bent. That's the bents of a child. And Proverbs is teaching us that we as parents are to learn the bents of our children and even as grandparents. And and everybody who's parented more than one child knows that there's no two alike. Different is not wrong. It's just different. 
and they're made in the image of God. So a lot of that, even though there's a fallen nature to all of us that must be redeemed by Christ, a lot of that is God-given, woven into them for the purposes of God. And so Proverbs is teaching us a lifestyle of wisdom. And shaping the spiritual development of the child means to focus on the child and the spiritual needs of the child and not the curriculum. A good teacher can take the worst curriculum in the world and make it live. A bad teacher can take the best curriculum in the world and kill it. So we learn their bents. We learn who they are. And we apply truth because truth never changes, but we apply it to them where they are. And uh, uh, the season of parenting pre-adolescent children, folks, is brief. We know that. We were kidding last night. Our state champion grandson was hanging out with his cousin who's at A&M. You'd think a senior in high school would really love being on a college campus, Right? But there came a time when he said bye to the college student and drove back home to go over to his girlfriends. It comes time as grandparents, folks, they love us, but it's not their world. I mean, that young lady or those friends or whatever, and that's not a shot at us. Different stages, different ages different people from generation to generation, never perfect. We're never perfect. We're never sinless, but we overcome more and more each generation. There are some things my father told me. He said, you, if I have anything to do with it, you will never step foot inside of coal mines. I never have. Dad gave up everything he could to make sure that I had a different path. I have looked at things and done everything I could to try to help our children have a different path, and I've watched them do the same thing with their children. And that's how you rid yourself of generational curses. Of all these things in past generations that are evil and harmful and everything, you don't stand on a hill and scream at demons. You live it before them, and you teach them and you instruct them. Wise people are lifelong learners, lifelong disciples, and we transmit that from generation to generation. The second thing I want you to see in this is that wise people protect their path. We protect our path. That means to protect our integrity, to protect our honor, to protect our character, to protect our name. In verse 9 there, I read them three virtues that were in that. Right which always refers to righteousness, just and fair. When there is an ethical disconnect, there is a heart issue. The heart of the problem is very often a problem of the heart. But God gives wisdom through his mouth, verse 6 says, which is his word, the scriptures. Now the prophets call for a new heart in Israel. When they were the pre-exilic prophets before the exile, they were commanding the people to repent, to turn, and telling that God was going to bring judgment. And Jeremiah and Ezekiel especially prophesied in several passages of a time when God would give a new heart, when he would put his spirit within us. And that time came with the coming of the Lord Jesus and the day of Pentecost, after the crucifixion, after the resurrection. Jesus used the metaphor born again in John chapter 3, verse 7, of a transformation of the heart, the transformation of the attitude toward God, the transformation of the attitude toward others. It's the forgiveness of our sins and the implantation of a new nature that gives us different want-tos and different desires and a desire to please God. It's not just a desire to be religious. In fact, if it stops there, you've missed it. It's a heart relationship. 
And that's why Jesus went to the cross and died on the cross and shed his blood. And in his blood shed, there is a new covenant, not the blood of the lambs and the goats of the Old Testament, but the blood of the Son of God at the cross covering our sin. And when we respond to him in repentance and faith, and repentance is simply that 80-degree turn where we turn from our own way and our own lifestyle, and we turn and embrace him and trust him as our Lord and Savior. That's faith. Something happens inside that Jesus refers to as being born again, born all over. Has that happened to you? If it hasn't, it can today because it doesn't take long. It just takes a moment for you to say, I know I'm a sinner. And I want to make that 180 degree turn from living for myself and Lord Jesus to live for you. I believe God raised you from the dead and I will confess you as my Lord. And there isn't a denomination in that. There isn't anything religious in that. It's all relationship with the living God. So how does one protect their path, their character, their walk with God? Uh, First of all, know God's Word. You may read a lot of books, and you should, but don't miss reading this one. Get a Bible and a translation you understand. Because they're all translated on different. The difference between some of the older translations like the New American Standard, the King James Version, those, transvers- those translations were translated with complex sentences. And sometimes those complex sentences are difficult to navigate for some people. But for others, the New Living Translation, the New International Version, the Christian Standard, those translations are more simple sentences. They're translated on a lower educational level. Find the one that works for you and read it and study it and then trust God's providence. In chapter 10 through 19, in chapter 4, uh, rather chapter 2, verses 10 through 19, chapter 4, 10 through 25, Solomon is telling us of the value of God's providence. He talks about ears in 420, chapter 4, verse 20. He talks about our ears. We need to listen to God. And there's all kinds of crazy stuff online, taking shots at different people in different ways. Pay no attention to that. God speaks. You may never hear an audible voice, but God will take his truth and he'll press it to your heart. And he gives us ears to hear. Just listen, listen. Trust his providence. He gives us a heart to guard. In verse 23 of chapter 4, When he talks about the words, he said, their life to those who find them and health to a man's body. And in verse 23, above all else, guard your heart for it's the wellspring of life. Another translation says, for out of your heart flow the issues of life. See, everything begins in the mind, drops down into the seat of our affections, the seat of our emotions, the seat of our decisions, our will, which the Bible refers to that as the heart. It's not just the physical pumping organ. And when we make choices, that activates what we do with our hand and our feet. Guard your heart. A lot of junk that Satan puts in our mind can get stopped right down here if we'll just put up a stop sign. If we know God's word, nope, that's not right. That's not the way this is lived. And don't ever kid yourself. There are a lot of people. There are a lot of people that carry big Bibles that don't live it. But that doesn't make the life void. We're all an example or a warning. One of the two. And if we want to be an example, we guard our heart. We guard 
our, our lips. We trust God's providence. We avoid the double heart that Proverbs 12, 2 talks about. That's a crafty heart. The schemer. At least Palau wrote a book about Joseph and his exploits in Genesis, and he titled it The Schemer and the Dreamer. One of his brothers was a schemer, a double heart. Proverbs talks about a hard heart in chapter 28, verse 14, where perhaps the problems of life, the reverses of life, hard labor, being betrayed, all of those kinds of things can serve to harden our heart if we're not careful. And once we get a hard heart, that's hard to overcome. A proud heart. He talks about it in Proverbs 21, 4. An unbelieving heart in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. It, uh, uh, let me read that because it is an interesting construct. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily. As long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Guard it. Guard your heart. Guard your affections. Guard your emotions. He talks about a cold heart as well as an unclean heart. So how do we protect our character? How do we protect our integrity? How do we protect our path? We know God's Word. We trust God's providence. And we obey God's will. We obey Him. Remember early January 1st, uh, I, I quoted from the statement by Charles Stanley and his organ. They sent me some little cards. We're looking at them to see if those life principles, if we want to order enough to put out in the pews. But one of them is obey God and leave all the consequences to Him. That saves us a lot of turmoil. Trust God and leave all the consequences to Him. And, and then the last thing that... I've gleaned out of these chapters. You can go all day long through the Proverbs. There's so many. There's so much here. But I've lumped these into three major categories. And the first one is wise people are committed to lifelong learning, lifelong discipleship. Are you still learning? Or are you just living off the reserves of what you've learned in the past? Those are important. But don't stop learning. The second thing is wise people protect their character. They protect their path, their reputation. And then last of all, wise people finish well. Solomon did not. Solomon at life, later years, corrupted himself. By the very things that he had written in Proverbs, he himself violated. And he didn't finish well. Socrates, the philosopher, before he drank the hemlock, said the unexamined life is not worth living. Have you examined your life lately? The Apostle Paul writes, to the church at Corinth, examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Because some denominations have their ritual uh, of infant baptism and then later on uh, a, a, a certain time where there's a consecration and things of that nature. And uh, in my growing up year, preachers would preach against that and they would make fun of it. And sometimes we do the very same thing in our church. Grandma pushes little Jimmy out in the aisle when he's five, six years old. He goes forward, shakes hands with a preacher, prays a little prayer he doesn't know anything about, and he has no more sense of conversion to the Christ than the man in the moon. That's why we're careful with every child to put them in an instruction and a guide where Stacy and the parents and myself can work together to make sure that that child understands that while these rituals have meaning and they're important in some sense of the word, they're not salvation. Salvation is faith in Jesus Christ. 
And baptism comes after that. Church membership comes after that. The Lord's Supper comes after that. So my question to you is, have you been converted? You know a lot of Bible. You know a lot about Jesus. You know a lot about church. You know a lot about ritual. Some can recite the constitution of the church more than they can John 3.16. Have you been born again? Wise people finish well. The old song, Sweeter. Sweeter as the days go by. Ought to be the song of all of us. Is our growth and our walk with the Lord in the ups and downs of this world? And this world is a world of death. There's no question about that. It's interesting that death in the Old Testament has to do with far more than just that terminus date when we cease to breathe and we cease to function on this planet, but it has to do with all the things of life that are deadly, that are harmful, that are painful. There are seasons of death, but there are seasons of joy. Test yourself. Aren't you glad Paul didn't say, ask the preacher to test you? He said, test yourself. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you can count the day or the hour or whether it was a season of your life when you turned in faith and trust to Him, the Spirit of God came to live inside you and God's Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. You can't get any more assurance than that. Any better assurance than that? Examine yourself. Finish well. Because death is that whole realm of conflict with life rather than a single event. But that single event is coming. And we have no idea who he's coming for next or when. So you say, wow. So, Pastor, what do I do? Well, Number one, if you're in a hole, stop digging. Stop digging. And in relationships, as much as you know and as much as you can, make right what is wrong. And there are some people that don't want to make right with you whoever you are, whatever it is. You can only come so far in that. But you do what you can. And you began to immerse yourself in the Scripture. Do some fun things. Do family things. Enjoy life. When I read the Gospels, I do not believe that Jesus walked all over Galilee with a frown on his face, a grunt when people greeted him, and humming in an A-flat whine some old song. His mercies are new and fresh every single day. And I believe that's how Jesus lived. Had a great sense of humor. You read through the Gospels and you'll see it. It's almost if his conversations with some of the religious leaders, he was looking over at his disciples and saying, watch this. And he answered. And he talked. And he laughed. I hate to tell you this, I'm not advocating anybody going out and starting drinking alcoholic beverages, and Scripture certainly forbids drunkenness. But whatever the wine was in the New Testament, it wasn't Welch's grape juice, and Jesus drank it. In fact, he turned a whole bunch of water into it at a wedding. And they looked at him and they said, man, the wedding host, 
this is great. Most people save the bad stuff for last. So what I'm, my point I'm making to you, there's a sense of party taking place. There's a sense of joy taking place. It's not just being in the temple. It's not just being in the place of public worship, though we're to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. Finish well. Die with a smile on your face and Jesus on your lips. And leave a testimony. Because that's what wise people do. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Those of you that are watching the YouTube and many of you gathered here as the band comes to uh, take their places and lead us in our hymn of invitation, uh, for some of you, you've never really trusted Jesus. When I talked about examining yourselves and being born again, there was this little twinge in your heart. I'm not sure. Pastor, I don't know. I want to help you. Right where you sit with your head bowed and eyes closed, just for privacy, for privacy around you, for privacy for yourself. If you would give your life to Jesus, open your heart and simply say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sin. I believe you were buried. God raised you from the dead. I open my life and welcome you to come in and take control. Help me live for you. Help me through the power of the Holy Spirit to understand your word and apply it to my life and to my family and to my relationships. And I give you my life as best as I know how. And trust you as best as I know how. If you're watching the video, let the church know. Call us, and we'll be happy to reach back toward you. There are people in this room that may have prayed that simple prayer. If you did, would you be open enough to lift your hand and say, Pastor, I prayed that little prayer with you just then. I want Jesus in my life. Just lift it up. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in the back of the pew, there's that little card. If you'd fill that out and leave it on the back table. And after we sing just a verse or two, we want to give you an opportunity to respond. If you feel God's calling you to join this church, we want you to come. And then after we close our services, I'll be right down here at the front if you want to have a private conversation. So.